Uh, thank you, Alex, for that introduction. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as Alex said, my name is Taylor, and I'm responsible for energy balances on the annual energy statistics team at the IEA. Uh, my colleague, Nicola Cohen, who's also responsible for energy balances, is uh, in the chat to answer any of your questions. Um, so today I'll be presenting energy balances, and of course, we'll have Q&A at the end of this presentation. Um, so please uh, feel free to ask your questions in the chat, and um, uh, we can also have Q and A, uh, and we can address them when uh, I get to the the end of the presentation. So uh, now that we have uh, my colleagues have presented uh, on the different energy products uh, that can be uh, consumed within a national energy system. We look to use an energy balance in order to put these statistics together and to create a complete picture of an energy system for a country. So today I'll be discussing what is an energy balance, why we create energy balances, um, how you can create an energy balance. I'll talk more a bit about the IEA energy balance layout specifically, which is based on the international recommendations for energy statistics. And then finally, I'll look briefly at uses of energy balances. So uh, I'd like to start off with the Menti. So the question is, uh, is your country pr currently producing a national energy balance? So uh, you can use the code at the top of the screen in order to join the Menti at uh, menti.com. So I see that uh, many of you, uh, many of your countries are already developing energy balances that's, or have an energy balance that is uh, great to hear or in the process of developing it. So uh, either way, I hope that this presentation either gives you the tools to improve your existing energy balance or helps you um, uh, create a, a complete energy balance for, for your country. So uh, let's, Get back to the presentation. So first let's ask the question, what is an energy balance? So as I've said before, an energy balance is a complete picture of the energy supply and consumption of uh, a national energy system. So uh, for a given national territory and a given reference period, a single table can account for all the uh, energy products exiting, entering, and used within the system. So we have a couple key components of an energy balance. So within the rows, we can see, within the rows, we can see uh, in the top section of the energy balance, we have supply flows such as production, imports, and exports. And then this can be summarized within the energy flow total energy supply, often referred to as TES. We also have the transformation sector in the energy balance, and I'll discuss this more later. And then finally, we have a total final consumption portion of energy balance at the bottom. Uh, and this is where you can see how energy is consumed, for instance, in industry, transport, et cetera. Then across the columns of an energy balance, we have all the different energy products, such as coal, crude oil, natural gas. Uh, but the main component of an energy balance is that they're all within, all pro energy products are within energy units. So in the commodity statistics, you may have coal in kilotons, and you may have natural gas in terajoules. And this means that you can't really compare the two products. But within an energy balance, all energy products are converted to the same unit. So this allows you to compare these products and create a total column that gives you the complete picture of 
uh, how energy is uh, consumed within a country. So uh, another um, uh, way to depict an energy balance is the form of a Sankey diagram. So this is essentially the reverse of a typical energy balance. So instead of having the products across the columns, you have the products within the rows and the fl energy flows across the columns. So we can see moving horizontally across the page how energy products are uh, supplied and then eventually consumed. So this is a very useful visualization of an energy balance. In order to create the, this type of visualization, you first need to create the table. And this is what we'll look into more in this presentation today. So uh, why do we create energy balance? Um, so as I said, one of the main advantage of an energy balance is that it allows you to compare products between each other and then also compare energy systems uh, between two countries. So um, because we have the total column of the energy balance, we can look at to uh, we can look at indicators such as total energy supply and consumption, and as well as patterns for the whole energy market. We can also look at things such as the relative weight of different energy sources within the total mix. Um, so in order to calculate these types of uh, indicators, you need to have have a comparability between energy products as well as the total column. You uh, can also use it to look at consumption shares across sectors of economic activity. Uh, when combined with population and economic data, we can look at uh, indicators such as energy intensity, dependence on energy imports, and other socioeconomic indicators, which I'll also discuss more later in the presentation. And then if we're uh, using, uh, if countries' energy balance uh, are within the same, uh, uses the same methodology, then this allows us to um, compare countries uh, and see how, and also uh, aggregate countries into regions to see how that region is evolving. So this is some of the key work that the EIA does. Um, but in order to do this, we need to ensure that um, countries are using comparable energy balances. Uh, the energy balance is also uh, important for data quality. So this is another way that you can look at key uh, indicators of data quality, such as statistical differences and uh, efficiencies in the transformation sector. Okay, so now that we know why we should create an energy balance, uh, we can look at how energy balance balances are created. So uh, my colleagues have already explained how to uh, collect data for commodity statistics for each of the different fuels. So this may be done through questionnaires or through uh, your own national data collection systems. So now that we have the commodity statistics in their natural units, so this may be mass, for example, we need some type of uh, way to convert the mass units into energy units, which is used for the energy balances. So how do we do this? So we'll do a quick Menti um, here. So to convert mass into energy units, uh, what do we need of these three factors? So the options here are density, calorific value, or carbon content. Great. So I see that many of you are uh, familiar with this already and uh, have identified that the correct answer is calorific value. So um, 
uh, calorific value is uh, represented in the form of energy per unit mass. So uh, once you have statistics by product, then we can apply calorific values, which gives you how much energy is contained within units of that product. And then we may do some format changes, which I'll discuss later. And with these tools, then you have, you can create your energy balance. So uh, just to reiterate, a caloric value is the amount of heat attained from one unit of mass or volume of the fuel. And it is the only way to convert a fuel quantity from physical units into energy units. So these are truly essential to the creation of energy balances. So let's, um, not only are they essential to just creating energy balances, but caloric values are also key to the quality of the energy balances. So let's look at an example here. So here we have a commodity balance for coal and units of kilotons. And we can see that there are currently no statistical differences in this commodity balance. So we have our calorific values uh, and we have for coal calorific value by flow as the uh, energy contents of different uh, flows can vary, especially for coal. And so we apply these energy, uh, these calorific values to create, uh, to get the data in terms of energy. But we can see now that we have 200 terajoules of statistical difference. So we have to ask, where did this come from? Well, if you look at the calorific values by flow, we can see that the calorific uh, values on the supply side are higher than the calorific values on the demand side. So the energy content of supply is higher than demand and this creates a statistical difference. So this is why it's very important to not only collect good energy, uh, good statistics um, in physical quantities, but also good quality calorific values. So uh, there are several methodological choices that go into the creation of an energy balance. Uh, and the IEA uh, has its own methodology for creating an energy balance based on the international recommendations for energy statistics. So uh, in this section of the presentation, I will talk about several key methodological choices that the IEA has made uh, to create our, our standardized energy balance format. So first of all, we need a common energy unit to show the balance in. And so the IEA has chosen joules. Um, so this is often uh, in the uh, terajoules or petajoules. Um, so uh, our data online is released in joules, um, although you will see uh, we uh, were previously using um, tons of oil equivalent. So many of our historical publications have uh, data uh, in thousand tons of oil equivalent. In the end, it's um, for energy units, it's very much up to um, uh, the country to choose the energy units. So another key uh, choice is whether to use net or gross calorific values. And uh, a reminder, the difference between net and gross calorific values is the latent heat of vaporization of the water produced during combustion. Um, so the IEA has chosen to use the net calorific value since this is represents the useful energy content of an energy product. Um, and so uh, this is uh, also very important to make sure that the calorific values used to create energy balance are all within net energy terms because there can be a significant difference between gross and net calorific values. For instance, um, the gross calorific value of natural gas is 10% higher typically than the net calorific value. So, uh, I know I've already mentioned calorific values many times, but it's I really must emphasize that they're very important to the creation of energy balances. So not only is it important to have calorific values for a single year, but calorific values can vary over time between products from country to country and um, from flow to flow. So uh, there can be a lot of work involved with, um, excuse me, uh, in collecting calorific values, but they are very important to good quality uh, energy statistics. And the IEA does have a database specifically for calorific values that we use um, to track them across all these dimensions. 
So another very important um, uh, choice uh, for energy balances is how to determine the primary energy equivalents of non-combustible sources. So combustible sources such as gas and coal and oil have measurable inputs in the context of transformation. So if we know how much electricity is coming out of a gas-fired generation plant, and we know can measure how much natural gas is going into that plant. So we have both inputs and outputs. But for non-combustible sources like nuclear, geothermal, um, solar, and wind, we have our output values. So we know how much electricity is produced, for example, from solar, but how do we represent the inputs in the energy balance? So um, this is a very important methodological choice, especially for countries with a lot of renewables in their uh, energy system. So uh, the first step is defining what is the primary energy to be considered in the supply source supply part for each energy product. So we can we consider the first uh, primary energy form downstream for which multiple energy uses are practical. So this is heat for uh, nuclear, geothermal, and solar thermal energy products, and this is electricity for hydro, wind, wave, and ocean, and solar. So this, these are the primary energy forms for these products. And primary energy form is defined as the first downstream form for which multiple energy uses are practical. So now that we've identified the primary energy form of each of these products, how do we calculate the primary energy equivalent? Well, the IEA has opted for the physical energy content method. So to calculate the primary energy equivalent, you must calculate the physical energy content of the primary energy form chosen in the previous step. So uh, the implied efficiencies using this method uh, are as follows. And so uh, we can see for electricity, if as a primary energy form, then using the physical energy content method, the implied um, efficiency will be 100%. And uh, if heat as a primary energy form, then the efficiencies will vary. So uh, I'll explain a bit more on the next slide. Uh, so let's say you have a thousand terajoules of electricity output from wind. So uh, we know the energy output in this case, and we need to calculate the primary energy equivalent in order to include it as input and energy balance. So we know the primary energy form for wind is electricity, and we already have uh, energy output as electricity. So therefore, the implied efficiency is 100% because we're converting electricity to electricity. So we need to put 1,000 terajoules of wind as input in the energy balance. So um, this is how we can use our implied efficiencies listed in the previous slide to convert energy outputs into their primary energy equivalents. So we can, you can also see the examples here for nuclear, geothermal uh, electricity, and geothermal heat. So uh, to summarize, the primary energy equivalent is the energy output divided by the implied efficiency. So we'll do a quick example now, also using Menti. So what is the primary energy equivalent for solar thermal with a thousand terajoules of electricity produced? So you have your output of solar thermal is a thousand terajoules of electricity. And in this case, we need to figure out what is the primary energy equivalent. Uh, and a hint here is that for solar thermal, the primary energy form is heat. So we have to convert the electricity output into the primary energy form, which is heat.
Okay, so I see we have some split responses. So the correct answer here uh, is actually uh, 3,030 terajoules. So we have 1,000 terajoules of electricity as our output, and we know our primary energy form of solar thermal is heat. So the applied efficiency here is 33%. So in this case, you would have to take 1,000 terajoules and divide by 33%. So uh, don't worry if you didn't get it this time, because uh, in our exercise session following this presentation, we will look at this concept some more. Okay, so now that we've touched, uh, discussed the methodology, let's look at the IEA, IEA energy balance layout. So as I said, this is based on the international recommendations for energy statistics and allows for comparability within regions and between countries. Um, so some key structural features of the IA balance, as I said, we have um, the supply, we have transformation sector, and we have total final consumption. So you'll notice in the supply section, we have zero production for oil products and zero production for electricity. But we know that uh, there's electricity produced in this country and there's oil products produced in this country. So the reason why production is zero is because oil products and electricity are secondary uh, energy forms. So they are outputs of transformation and therefore in the energy balance, they will be represented uh, as outputs from the transformation sector, as opposed to indigenous indigenous production. So only primary energy can uh, production of primary energy should be in count should be counted in the production row for in an energy balance. So uh, now looking at the transformation sector, uh, we can see how uh, the per, uh, how refinery output of oil products are accounted for here. So we have uh, negative values in the transformation sector represent an input to transformation and positive values represent an output from transformation. So if we look at the oil refinery row, we can see crude oil has a negative value representing crude oil input to oil refineries. And then we can see that oil products has a positive value and this represents oil product output from oil refineries. So um, this is a very important uh, concept and it's also very useful because in the total row, row we have, uh, the, sorry, the total column, we have the sum of all transformation processes. So we can look at the total column to see the refinery losses uh, for this particular transformation product process. And then, of course, another key component of the energy balance is in the total row, we have totally total energy supply, which is a very important uh, indicator for a country. OK, uh, now that you know all about energy balances, I'll quickly go over how they can be used. So uh, as I mentioned before, you can combine uh, aspects of the energy balance with uh, uh, socioeconomic indicators such as population and GDP, and this can create uh, many useful indicators uh, that can be used to represent dis different um, aspects of a country. So, for instance, uh, we can look at the energy indicator of total energy supply per capita. So, uh, we can see how, uh, for instance, uh, a country's uh, access to energy uh, evolves over time and how uh, in this example, uh, households have more access to energy uh, as uh, the country develops. So another very interesting indicator is TES over GDP, which is also referred to as energy intensity. So energy intensity represents the energy efficiency of a country. So how efficiently can a country transform uh, energy into monetary output? So ideally, uh, this number should be low as you want to efficient, uh, efficiently uh, create um, value. Uh, and this is another uh, way that you can, uh, that uh, another indicator that can be used in analysis and be used for uh, to compare countries. 
So another uh, indicator is self-sufficiency. So this is calculated as production over total energy supply. And so this can be used to look at the energy security of a country. So can a country produce what it consumes? So if the self-sufficiency, which is production over TES, is over 100%, then yes, a country can meet its own demand. But if it's under that amount, then the country must, for instance, import products in order to meet demand. Um, and finally, another very important use of energy balances is that they are used to create, uh, to calculate CO2 emissions. So once the balance is created, uh, then this is the next step is uh, calculating the amount of CO2 emitted, which of course uh, is very important in tracking countries' progress towards uh, climate goals. Uh, the energy balances are also used in the tracking of official sustain sustainable development goals, um, such as uh, SDG 7.2 on renewable energy and SDG 7.3 on energy efficiency. So uh, the uh, IEA's energy balances are used um, to calculate and uh, track these, these goals. So uh, in conclusion, uh, good energy balances require good quality statistics, both physical data and calorific values. They are compact source of information, so they can be used to summarize the picture of a, the whole picture of a country's uh, energy system. They enable accurate checks of energy statistics, energy statistics such as looking at losses, uh, transformation efficiencies, and statistical differences. And they constitute the foundation for basic energy indicators, energy accounting, and for CO2 emissions estimates. So thank you very much for your attention during this presentation. Uh, we will now have a Q&A session uh, um, uh, and also uh, I'm sure you've seen these slides before. If you need any more information on energy balances or examples, we have lots of data available on our website and you can contact us with any questions that aren't answered in the Q&A session at balances at IEA.org. So thank you very much for your attention.